Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News. Brianna Venosi is off tonight. I'm Michael Hill. COVID is not done with us. Strong words from the governor today as he quashed rumors and said New Jersey schools are not closing. The governor painting a grim picture of the coronavirus spreading in the Garden State. The state health department reporting more than 3,500 new positive cases today, almost 10,500 cases since Monday. The health commissioner said, if we continue on this pace, we will be back where we were in the spring. The cumulative number is now nearly 267,000, with 18 additional deaths, bringing us to nearly 16,500 total fatalities since the start of this pandemic. And hospital beds starting to fill up. Today, there are 1,827 patients in our hospitals, the most since early June. Let these numbers sink in. COVID is not done with us, unfortunately, not by a long shot. And unless we all recommit to the common sense measures that got us past the first horrendous months of this pandemic, we are in for a long, dark winter before a vaccine becomes broadly available. Again, we have got to get back to using our common sense for the common good. The governor said we cannot let up on social distancing or on wearing masks and emphasized the CDC now says that wearing a mask is a stronger measure of protection than previously thought, even though he said it's been politicized and there's mask wearing fatigue. And when I asked about folks finding it uncomfortable. You know what's really uncomfortable and annoying? When you die, that's my answer. The governor also announced a coalition of seven states, New Jersey plus all six New England states have formed a compact it will prohibit interstate youth hockey games and tournaments in the face of the virus's second wave. He also mentioned getting a new rapid test from the federal government that is 99% accurate with results in 20 minutes. A new weapon in the battle saw the growing number of restrictions in Newark, now with some of the highest positivity rates in the entire state. The mayor is reimposing nightly curfews because he says people in some Newark communities are more likely to catch COVID-19 than anybody else and are more likely to die. Today, he told the public more about what he's trying to achieve. Senior correspondent Brendan Flanagan reports. On the streets of Newark's Ironbound, reaction to the new 9 p.m. curfew decidedly mixed. I think the curfew is kind of drastic, really. And I think it's um, going to affect local merchants, local businesses that have to close early. We've already taken a toll. I think we should do the right thing. If they're asking us to close at 9, be out of the streets at 9, we should do it before it get worse. An alarmed Mayor Ras Baraka said it is worse. We are back where we were in April and May. He laid out the numbers. The city's COVID case loads now average 220 a day and positivity rates in red zones like the Ironbound top 35 percent, almost triple the state rate. So Newark will start locking down the way it did back in spring because Baraka said it worked. I know these measures seem extreme, extreme, and we've been getting pushback from a lot of people. I was the mean father, the bad guy in April, and, and I was getting emails and texts about how horrible and draconian these measures were. In June and July, people were sending me roses. Baraka today ordered a 9 p.m. weekday and 10 p.m. weekend curfew in three hotspot zip codes, parts of 07104 and 07, and all of 05 minus the airport. That's on top of the city's 8 p.m. closing time for all non-essential businesses, which will continue indefinitely. It's a tall order for bars and restaurants like Spanish Sangria, already hit hard by COVID restrictions. I know uh, Newark is uh, the hot spot, you know what I mean? So we just got to follow the rules and go with it. Are you worried 
about the impact on the business? Yes, the, you see the impact on a business, especially when you take the bar. Most of the people just come for the bar, you know what I mean? But new state restrictions prohibit sitting at the bar, so crowds are sparse. Because we used to have this restaurant full of people, now people are scared. We have customers from Texas, Tennessee, uh, all around, you know what I mean? So they don't come because of the of the buyers. Uh, they say Newark is the hot spot, they don't come anymore. The curfew takes effect today. The mayor says people who defy it will get warnings the first couple days. After that, they'll get summonses. I think if things continue to go this way, we should probably do more. Because what we do know for a fact is that more works. Baraka also ordered indoor gatherings restricted to 10 or fewer people and shut down school sports for at least two weeks. The city's restrictions go well beyond new 10 p.m. bar and restaurant closing caps that take effect statewide tonight. But Governor Murphy today signed a new executive order giving local governments the option to regulate operating hours of non-essential businesses after 8 p.m. Our approach to the second wave is to act surgically within hotspot areas. And that means giving local officials the ability to take actions to prevent localized hotspots from, beco from becoming COVID wildfires. The issue is, Brenda, whether people are congregating indoors or not and engaging in high-risk behaviors. Dr. Sharif El-Nahal says Newark's University Hospital admitted almost 40 COVID patients today, more than they will discharge. They've been raising red flags for weeks. Our surge plan has been activated. Uh, our emergency management team has been activated, and uh, we are making sure that we implement it so that we can, as long as possible, be able to safely separate those patients with coronavirus from those without. And we have a plan that allows us to do that for up to about 140 patients. He supports Baraka's new restrictions. The most important priority is to keep people safe. Uh, you can bring back the economy, you can bring back businesses, you can't bring back lives. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. As the numbers go up, the need for in-person gatherings must go down, warned the governor. Add Seton Hall University to the list of places going all virtual today. It's about reducing liability and preventing contracting and spreading the virus. Raven Santana looks at how the state's colleges and universities are dealing with the sudden surge. The campus is deserted. There's barely anyone outside. People are really scared. I believed something big like this was going to happen. With cases rising throughout the state and New Jersey college campuses seeing COVID spike, Seton Hall University says it is taking steps to protect students, announcing that it would be switching to all remote learning today at all three of its campus locations. Since August, Jersey has seen a number of clusters at colleges, including Rowan University, which saw 689 cases, Monmouth University, which saw 430 cases, Stevenson's Institute of Technology, which saw 30 cases, and since March, NJIT saw 42 cases, and since May, Rutgers saw 480 cases. Social distancing safety measures aren't just causing some students to experience feelings of loneliness, it's also causing financial strain for students who remain on the hook for room and board, despite some colleges and universities deciding to go virtual during the semester. Even though I have to go home, I do have to pay full tuition to come to Seton Hall, and it's very frustrating because I have to think to myself, is it worth it putting in all this money, all this hard-earned money to school? And being that this is, uh, this is an abrupt exit, just like last semester, that maybe we can get some financial compensation back since this is not the extended time that we, you know, wanted for it at the beginning of the semester. Seton Hall University students Amarillis Rodriguez and Ronnie Jerez's financial concerns are echoed by students at Montclair State University, which has seen 55 cases since August. The vice president for communications and marketing says the school is taking into consideration the financial needs of the students. Uh, as we expected, Raven, the um, virus is picking up. Our board froze tuition for this year. Our alumni and donors have very generously donated to a student emergency fund. So if someone's really in dire need, um, we have the ability to uh, step in and assist them. The last thing we want to do is to have the pandemic cause someone's education to be interrupted. But students feel the university isn't doing enough, with some calling for refunds for the room and board that is no longer needed. I came back to campus because I live 45 minutes away with no traffic. And then a week into the semester, 
all of my classes decided they were going to go online. And my parents had paid all the tuition money. And room and board is about seven grand, probably more. Um, so I, I definitely would have been up, you know, seven grand, most likely more than that. My dad recently lost his job due to COVID. So it's becoming hard to pay for it. Like I emailed them and I signed the con like I signed the release form, but they haven't done anything per se to um, help me get out of it. And all they said was like, maybe you can find a cheaper option. But I am living in the cheapest option right now. As of now, none of the students I spoke with are receiving any type of refund for room and board after being told their classes would be all remote. Both Seton Hall University and Montclair State University stand by their strict safety measures as a way to prevent rising cases on campus. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. And you can find all the daily COVID-19 numbers, latest reporting, breaking news and resources about the coronavirus on a special section of our website. Head to njspotlightnews.org and click on the coronavirus tab. On election night, we left the studio with Congressman Tom Malinowski, the declared winner in District 7 against Republican challenger and state Senate minority leader Tom Kane Jr. The margin was 28,000 plus votes. The vote counting continued, and now Malinowski's lead has shrunk below 10,000 votes. Our editor-at-large, Colleen O'Day, has kept an eye on this race and the state's vote count since election night and joins us now. Hey, Colleen, so Malinowski's lead has really narrowed here, huh? It sure has. Um, you know, back on election night, um, AP called the race uh, fairly quickly. He, had, uh, he was 11 points ahead. Uh, now he's only 2.3 points ahead. Um, and that's not terribly surprising uh, because what happened in New Jersey is really kind of the opposite of what we saw in a lot of the swing states, which is that Republican votes are coming in later than, um, than some of the Democratic votes. Democrats were really excited, um, sent back their mail-in ballots early. Republicans did dissent theirs in later or came out and voted in person. So there are a lot of votes still outstanding that have to be counted in this race. Do we know anything about that at this point? Unfortunately, we really don't. Because of the way this election was uh, conducted, we don't have the typical precincts coming in where we know votes came in from this town or that town. Uh, we've got mail-in ballots from you know an entire uh, community, an entire county, and provisionals from an entire uh, community or or county. Um, we can say that there, the estimate is that more than 95% of the votes have been counted and we've got 386,000 votes that have been counted so far. So do either of these camps think that the declared winner thing, that status is going to change? Um, so the, the Kane camp surely does he has not conceded and republicans continue to say that they think there are high um probability republican voters who went out on election day or who have some of those lagging mail-in ballots um but the democrats think malinowski's campaign thinks that this is gonna the result is gonna hold it may it may tighten more but that he will ultimately be declared the winner again uh, Colleen, no hijinks or anything like that. No fraud that anybody's talking about. This is just what the nature of voting by mail. Absolutely, yeah. There's no, there's no, uh, no one saying anything that there is, uh, as you said, hijinks in uh, involved in this. Uh, it's just it takes a long time to count mail-in ballots because there's this whole process you go through. It's not like just you know walking in and flipping a lever and then the computer does the work for you. Right. Colleen O'Day. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Michael. Patterson's two police unions filed suit this week against their chief. They claim union leaders who spoke out were targeted for retaliation. Tensions in the city are already high. A record number of shootings in Patterson with seven weeks left in the year. It has residents on edge. The city broke its previous record on Tuesday and has now logged 106 shootings. The violence has killed 21 people and wounded 124. Patterson has not seen this kind of escalating violence since 2013. Joanna Gagas breaks it down for us. And yes, we've seen, like many cities in the country, a rash of gun violence, but it hasn't deterred us. 
We're not going away. We're not giving up. We're going to get those guns. It just don't stop. It's an everyday thing. It never stops. As the coronavirus enters its next deadly wave, a wave of gun violence is sweeping the streets of Patterson. 106 shootings this year have wounded 124 people and killed 21. It's a number the city hasn't seen since 2013. We've seen this clear, you know, nonviolence from January, and then all of a sudden in April, we've seen this spike as, you know, COVID came to a reared its ugly head. I'm standing at the corner of 11th and 25th where there was a shooting at 930 in the morning just earlier this week. This is a neighborhood. There's a bodega on the corner and many families who live nearby who say the violence feels constant and they don't want to leave their homes. I live right here in the corner and I'm looking out the window and there's like just kids shooting into a house there, the neighbor and you know, there's I have two kids of my own. I'm afraid that, you know, one day how old are your kids? My son is, uh, he's 17, my daughter is 15, and I will not allow them to come and, um, you know, walk around or hang out with their friends. No, I wouldn't do that. And literally, I'm trying to find somewhere else to move because of that. This is happening throughout the nation. This is not just the Patterson crisis. And we are not sitting on our hands. We are using strategies. We are using programs, we are using hospital intervention, we are using violence interrupters, we are doing a number of things. Violence interrupters step in to keep disputes between community and gang members from turning into shootings. But many are still trying to understand why violent crime is on the rise. According to these residents. People are losing their jobs, not only their jobs, I know they're losing their homes, houses, family, you know what I mean? So what is it? You know they let about 400 inmates got, got out of prison. So it was a lot of people, a lot of kids that came out of jail, so they had problem. 12th Avenue have a problem with 10th Avenue. 10th Avenue have a problem with Park Avenue. He's critical of Governor Murphy's recent decision to release more than 2,000 nonviolent inmates from prison to avoid a repeat of what happened during the first wave of the pandemic, where 52 inmates died from the coronavirus. Spezial is skeptical that that's the cause of the shootings in Patterson. A lot of them are low-level offenders that have drug addiction problems. So a lot of them are going to our new, you know, re-entry programs. I think the number was somewhere in the area of 118 that came back into our county. It is a constant partnership, federal, state, county, local, in Patterson and beyond to combat the, uh, the gun violence issue. Loss of job, small businesses crushed, mental health stress, opioid use, whatever it might be, everything has been exacerbated in the year 2020. Spezial says anyone in the community can call him anytime. My cell phone number is 973-572-6746. In Patterson, I'm Joanna Gagas for NJ Spotlight News. New Jersey's job market is trending in the right direction even as we enter a second wave of COVID cases. Rhonda Schaffler has details in today's top business stories. Rhonda. Michael, for the fourth straight week, there was a drop in the number of New Jersey residents filing unemployment claims for the first time. In the most recent week, just under 21,000 residents filed claims. That's a drop of 15%. Nationally, initial jobless claims numbers are also falling. It is encouraging when these numbers drop, but of course there are still millions who remain unemployed. Also, just a reminder, and I did mention this yesterday, New Jersey residents have until midnight tonight to certify for additional federal unemployment benefits under that FEMA lost wages program. The state is offering another $60 million in grant money to small businesses hurting financially due to COVID-19. Tim Sullivan, the CEO of the Economic Development Authority, says the money will go to businesses that applied previously but got waitlisted when earlier funding ran out. This means at least another, at least another 13,000 businesses uh, that came into the application process uh, at the very end of October, uh, we'll be able to get funded. We had more applicants than we had, had funds, and now we've got funding to match every applicant. Like the prior round of funding, some of this money is earmarked specifically for restaurants, micro-businesses, and businesses located in opportunity zones. 
RWJ Barnabas Health is expanding again. The hospital chain has agreed to acquire Trinitas Regional Medical Center in Elizabeth. The two health systems have been talking about this for a while, and RWJ has agreed to make capital investments in Trinitas, which will remain a Catholic hospital. The plans include building two ambulatory surgery centers. This deal comes just a few weeks after RWJ, an underwriter of NJ Spotlight News, acquired St. Peter's in New Brunswick. Amazon's latest New Jersey expansion has nothing to do with warehouses or distribution centers. The online retailer plans to open a brick and mortar grocery store called Amazon Fresh in Woodland Park. No opening date has been set yet. There are only two other Amazon Fresh stores in the U.S., both of them in California. Now here's a check on the trading day. I'm Rhonda Schapfler and those are your top business stories. Support for the business report provided by ELEC and Operating Engineers 825, repairing our critical infrastructure and building our recovery. Learn more at elec825.org. And by Junior Achievement of New Jersey, celebrating 100 years as a mission and announcing this year's virtual NJ Business Hall of Fame on November 19th at 6 p.m. Event details online at janj.org. This weekend, join Rhonda Schaffler as she takes a deeper look at the stories, trends, and influencers shaping the state's business landscape with a roundup on all the major headlines as part of our new show, NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. You can find it on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel that Saturday mornings at 10. Atlantic City's mayor says it's a way to level the playing field. He wants the gaming mecca to be the only place where the state would allow the sale of recreational marijuana for the first three to five years. His city has taken a huge hit during the COVID-19 pandemic, and Mayor Marty Small says AC gets nothing from state-imposed parking, luxury, hotel, and sports betting taxes. So he knows how to remedy that. He joins us now to discuss his vision. Mr. Mayor, thank you for joining us. Please explain your vision for having Atlantic City as the sole place to sell recreational marijuana for the first three to five years in New Jersey. I mean, when you talk about the governor and lieutenant governor forming the Atlantic City Restart and Recovery Committee and a clear commitment to the great city of Atlantic City, um, that committee is tasked for economic development, new industries, jobs, et cetera. Um, there's not a better new industry to take advantage of than uh, the legalization of marijuana. Um, it's, it's, it's no different than starting a pilot program uh, in the city to make sure that it works. It would increase tourism here in the city of Atlantic City, and it would give our residents a much needed uh, revenue stream. Um, as you know, according to the data in 2018, $154.5 million uh, you know, goes north uh, from the city of Atlantic City. We don't get luxury tax, we don't get parking tax, we don't get hotel tax, and we don't get anything off of sports betting. Just think, in the month of September, the state of New Jersey made $748 million off of sports gaming, and the residents of the great city of Atlantic City got zero. Well, what about, though, the rest of the state, though? Places like Newark and Patterson and Trenton and Asbury Park, they certainly want a share of, uh, of legalization. No, I mean, listen, this is not against uh, any municipality or any part of the state. This is simply just um, looking out for the good people of Atlantic City. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's unimaginable that if someone comes to Atlantic City and they stay four days, they park their car, they eat in our restaurants, they gamble. Of course, they stay in a hotel, they, they, they bet on sports. And when they leave from a four day weekend, the residents of Atlantic City get nothing. And um, we have to do better with that. Um, we have to revisit some things. And um, as the mayor of the great city of Atlantic City, I'm going to keep up the good fight. Um, I just think it's an awesome uh, opportunity. Um, it would increase tourism if the city of Atlantic City is the only place, uh, you know, for a while. I didn't say in perpetuity. I stressed, you know, for a while. So um, I know that, um, you know, it's, it might not be popular in uh, other parts of the state, but among municipalities. But I'm the mayor of Atlantic City, and it's my job to look out for the best interest of the taxpayers of Atlantic City. I'm curious, have you proposed this to the state at all? No, well, I had a conversation with our state uh, representatives 
Um, I saw some comments uh, back and forth. Ultimately, it's a legislative decision. Um, but if I don't put it out there, that's just like when we went to the state house to uh, campaign for the city to get revenue for sports gaming. It fell on deaf ears. So it's a conversation that we need to have now versus when the law is final. What would it mean to Atlantic City if you had this? What are your finances like right now? No, I mean, uh, we're, we're on uh, strong fiscal ground uh, considering in the next three years, we are uh, projecting uh, three straight tax decreases. But the bottom line is we'll be in a much better position if we had revenue streams and we don't get anything, but um, the pressure is put on our services. You know, we have public works, we have uh, police, we have everything else. And if the residents had an additional revenue stream or streams, it will make life easier as a taxpayer here in the great city of Atlantic City. I would imagine you're in for a heck of a fight, though. You must be well prepared for this fight to challenge mm -hmm. other places and certainly to, to challenge other cities in the state over an issue like this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, listen, um, I'm always up uh, for a fight. Like I said, this is nothing against any other uh, municipality or any section of the state. This is just me simply looking out uh, for my hometown, which the good people of Atlantic City elected me to do. All right. Mr. Mayor, thank you. We'll be watching this. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. That does it for tonight. But if you missed any of the big stories this week, you can catch Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz Friday morning at 10 live on our YouTube channel, and then again at 6 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. on NJTV. That's our broadcast. I'm Michael Hill. For the entire news team, thanks for being with us. Good night. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey.